Well, as we continue with our word studies, looking more as to the characteristics of God, we took a look at grace, for example. Now we're going to take a look at the word glory. Uh, the, kind of a distinctly Christian word. I want to glorify the Lord. I just want to bring glory to God. At times it can kind of be a learned lingo. We can kind of learn the God talk. And I want to make sure that we have a good idea that, that this word really has very powerful everyday meaning. Um, and, and certainly, I think, can improve our understanding of God and our praise and appreciation uh, of God. As we take a look at this uh, key biblical term, uh, the idea of glory. Now, it's a term that appears in both covenants. That's why it's a key biblical word. These are words around which God has chosen to build His revelation, if you will. In the Old Testament, it's the Hebrew word kaved, or you'll hear it kavod at times. Uh, and the New Testament equivalent is that of doxa, uh, the doxology. You might have heard that phrase will come from that Greek word. But they're going to convey the same ideas in, in both covenants. Uh, and that is going to be an interesting, interesting study of words because maybe of all the words we've studied, glory might be the most robust uh, in, in, in language study. The word is pregnant. It's full of meaning. It is going to have a wonderful idea first in the literal usage of the word, but also uh, in the, in the uh, metaphoric usage. In the literal usage of the word kavod, primarily in the Old Testament, we're going to see this idea of that which is physically heavy uh, or large, something that is uh, just like we would see something that was big, that would be difficult to get around, that would be hard to lift. Um, we're going to see that idea exist uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, there's also a figurative usage, which interestingly also parallels what we, what we see in English. Um, in, in my generation, if, if something was um, something that needed to be thought about, uh, the, the, the person in the 60s and 70s would, would often say something like, well, you know, that's, that's pretty heavy. Let, let me think about that. There are other words, obviously, we'll talk about those in a moment uh, that we use today. Um, it, the, the idea didn't weigh anything. It, there wasn't really anything physical involved. But it wasn't just a typical run-of-the-mill decision. It required some thought. And that's the idea of, that's heavy. Let me give that some my some idea. That's true in the Bible. It's true in our culture as well, that there are uh, literal things that are called kavod or doxa, and there are metaphoric things that are called kavod or doxa. And the key to the interpreter is to figure out, am I dealing with physical or am I dealing with a metaphor here? And uh, I think the best understanding of that fig figurative idea is that of important. Uh, if something is heavy, it's important. I've got to deal with it. It's not the run-of-the-mill thing. Uh, so I, I deal with it as important, I, it seems, uh, I see its importance, or I want to make it seem important to you, which is really our uh, unlock, if you will, for glorifying the Lord. I might want to help that person over there see God as ever more rich and full and complete, ever more big, uh, and thus they could adjust themselves. Or in my own personal life, I, as I contemplate Him, I want to consider Him more and more important as I'm as I encounter the fullness of God as revealed in the Scripture. Uh, so that idea of heaviness or importance is really going to come uh, uh, through here. Uh, here. We'll start with some of the literal usages. So the first one's almost kind of almost funny. In 1 Samuel 4, um, Eli was this priest. He's a bad priest. He had two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, and they weren't good guys any, either. And this is sort of the inglorious, pardon the pun, end of, of Eli's life. He falls off his seat backwards, and his neck was broken, for he died, for he was old and heavy. He was overweight, and the weight of his, uh, of his body crashing down on his neck is what caused him to die. He's simply a way that the Old Testament described that which weighed a lot. Um, that's a literal heavy usage. Um, Absalom uh, apparently had a very nice head of hair, something which I would be most jealous of. He, Absalom cut the hair of his head, for it was heavy on him. I've not ever had that uh, recollection anyway, that my hair felt heavy on me. But it's just weighed a lot. He probably had a full, heavy head of hair, and so he would cut it because it weighed him down a bit. Physical weight of his hair. Uh, the literal use is just like what we see with the girth, if you will, of Eli. Um, here's kind of a mix of, the, of that concept here where that which is physically large might also be the place from which important 
decisions in this case are made. You've got to go back and understand that both Ezekiel and Daniel have been taken captive by Babylonian kings in their three separate invasions of Israel. And they, being Ezekiel and Daniel, are in Babylon as prisoners. Now, they have high places uh, within the court of the king, but nonetheless, they're not free to go. They're prisoners. And as typical of God, uh, as, as both these men seek to elevate God in that place, God elevates them. But Ezekiel and Daniel are known as the exilic prophets. They are the only two that write during that 70-year uh, exile in Babylon. And so stuff they write about is going to have the flavor and the nuance of things that are going on in Babylon. And so here's a, an example of that. In, in Ezekiel 21, uh, the king of Babylon is going to try to figure out how to make a decision. And so Ezekiel is describing how the king of Babylon makes decisions. He's not really prescribing this is the way to make decisions. He's just describing how the king of Babylon makes decisions. And our word is a part of that decision process, and, and it's worth hanging in there with me for it. For the king of Babylon, Ezekiel 21, 21 says, he stands at the parting of the way. Got to, am I going to go this way? Am I going to go that way? At the head of the two ways to use divination. Am I going to use, uh, am I going to divine from God? Do I go this way or that way? Apparently they shook the arrows and maybe threw the arrows out and maybe the arrows in their haphazard falling on the ground, the king believed that the gods were moving those arrows would point a certain way that you would go this way. He consults the household idols. He comes from a pantheon of gods uh, in his, his uh, approach to the Lord. So there'd be many different idols that he would bow down to and ask direction from. Um, those all kind of make sense. People have used those. But the last one's sort of an unusual one. He looks at the liver. Uh, that's not a normal way to determine God's will, at least uh, from where I've come from. And, and that idea really comes from the idea that the word liver here is the word kavod. The same word translated heavy to describe Eli, the same word translated heavy to describe Absalom's hair, the same word that will later be translated glory or to glorify God is translated liver here. Why? Why in the world would an English translator see the word kavod and translate it liver in the context of the king of Babylon trying to figure out which way to go? And the, the unlock, the idea, is that the liver, the physical organ, is also the largest and heaviest organ, the skin technically is, but, but an intact, in one place organ, the liver, it's where it's at. It's in the, the middle of our being, and many cultures kind of go there for a, what we might call a gut decision. So the liver being the heaviest organ, it makes sense that the liver being the, heavy, the biggest would also be the place where the heavy or large decisions were made. A lot of people think that way. So the liver, uh, seen here obviously in just a, a depiction, is this very large area in which a lot of people actually uh, sort of uh, viscerally make decisions not in their head, as many Westerners do, or not even in their heart, but in their gut. They kind of feel things in their gut and have that sensation. They accompany that with some ancient autopsies which reveal this large organ, and they simply concluded that liver is the place of the heavy decisions. And as a result, the New American Standard a translator uses the word liver in, in Ezekiel 21, 21. Pharaoh in e Ezekiel, or in Exodus rather, uh, chapter 8, remember he hardens his heart? Same word. He didn't, glory doesn't really work there. He made heavy his heart in the sense of making it impenetrable. His heart didn't actually gain weight. His heart didn't weigh more a minute after he hardened it, but as, it's as if he had added concrete and rock and, and, and all kind of, of uh, re, d, d, material that would deflect any kind of an attack. In this case, the attack would be coming from God. When Pharaoh saw this, that there was relief, he hardened his heart and did not listen to them, as the Lord had said. Her, Pharaoh's hardened heart, in essence, he made it heavy, uh, obviously metaphorically. The outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 18 was great. Their sin was grave 
The word translated grave is the Hebrew word kavod, the same word translated glory. So we see the word is not a God word only. There's all kind of things that are being described as important, a whole lot going on. Um, we don't use the word grave very often. You'll often hear it in medical lingo. Uh, the condition is, is critical. It is grave. Um, and that idea of, okay, this is very serious. It's very important that our attention now go uh, to that situation. Uh, here, the, the amount of sin that was uh, emitting, if you will, from Sodom and Gomorrah was heavy sin. It was a lot of it. It's not lightweight stuff. This was indeed so great that God will visit them in judgment later in that same chapter. The famine in, in, in Genesis 23 was kavod. Later translated glory, here translated severe. So it's not like it didn't rain for a couple of days. It's not raining for a couple of years. And this is becoming severe. It's impacting everything. And, 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 and thus, I, I, can't, I can't not attend to it. It's too important. That's that idea of kavod, of, of heaviness or importance, in, in, whether it be sin or, or, or here, uh, famine. Uh, the slang that we use can be helpful here. Uh, my generation would say the word heavy. Others might use the, uh, the pneumonic fat, and I know it's changed now, but that idea of excellent or luxury uh, was really important. Uh, cars were often called that. Some generations would use the word large. Others would use the word deep, steep, some would say. It's huge. It's mega. It's a big deal. It's epic. It's got to be dealt with. It's amazing. It, it's legit. It can't be blown off. It's too big. To uh, blow off. It's too legit to quit, kind of an idea. Whatever generation you come from, that idea of importance or heaviness exists. Um, and we see uh, in many, many cultures that idea uh, exists. Uh, uh, the, the culture of uh, the surfing world would, would, would see a wave like this and describe it as heavy. That's a big wave. That's not a little two footer off of Corpus Christi, Texas. That's a magnanimous wave that needs to be dealt with, with re, needs to be dealt with respect uh, and, and ridden accordingly. Uh, Psalm 19, as, as, as David looks out on the heavens, um, you got to understand stargazing was movie watching in, in the Old Testament. Uh, they didn't go to Netflix, they went to their roof and would uh, observe the, the, the heavens which were, had not been polluted with with ambient light or, 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 or the, uh, the pollution of, of in industry, and they would have seen things that were amazing, and, and they noticed that there was movement. And that, that's why the, the, the Bethlehem star was so amazingly and quickly seen. That this is an unusual star. This doesn't happen all the time. They would have picked it up immediately. And David, reflecting on that which he was very familiar with and seen every night, yet still was amazed by it, declares in Psalm 19, the heavens are telling the glory of God. Here's where we're a little bit more familiar, but even there, what does that word glory mean? That he's big, he's important, that the these solar system, which we now know later to be one of millions, is intricate and amazing. The, it's expansive. It declares the work of God's hand. Uh, it, it shows that something big and important is behind it. Um, God's portent, importance is seen in Psalm 19. <coughs> Pardon me. In, in Psalm 86, we see uh, the psalmist say, O Lord, they shall glorify thy name. Now, the, the concept of name, biblically, is all that one stands for. We don't, we don't use that term often anymore, but you might talk about uh, someone in your, in your community that's long-standing man or woman of character. They, they might have a good name in the community. That's how the name is used biblically. When we pray in Jesus' name, all that he stands for, his full reputation, his full character. They glorify the name of God, for you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. I will give thanks to thee, O Lord, my God, with all my heart I will glorify thy name forever. A little song comes from a nice little section there in Psalm 86. 2 Corinthians 4 uh, juxtaposes this idea of heaviness and lightness, beautifully bringing over the Old Testament idea of glory, heavy, contrasted with lightness. Notice in 2 Corinthians 4, he says, really, what we're going through now, which includes the trials, the temptations, the setbacks, uh, the, the, the tears, is in the grand scheme of things, momentary, light affliction. 
okay? And here's where perspective is so crucial to the scripture. To see that what we're going through now, and it can have wonder, it can be beautiful also, but it's also very difficult and, and, and very hard. And to not call it that is to lie, frankly. It's to not really be real and truthful. But a perspective of this nature can really help us handle the situations that come into our lives, which he describes here as momentary and light affliction because it's producing in us this eternal weight of glory. Now, for his New Testament audience, he wanted to make sure that they understood that glory had this idea of heaviness or weight, so he adds that term weight. But the key point for us is that which is light is really compared to that which is heavy or weighty or glorious. And so this light affliction is actually producing strong and important muscles, if you will, uh, and appreciation of God far beyond all comparison. So it's an interesting perspective on trials now, but also in our context of studying this world, where it shows us to see that it's the opposite of that which is light. You know, I, we, we, I think of the word to blow off. Uh, we'll use that term in our culture uh, pretty often. And uh, and I, I work with a lot of college students, and, and we'll, we'll work on their schedule sometimes or what they're doing to graduate, and they'll identify the various classes on their schedule. Uh, and they're not all equal. Uh, certainly juniors and seniors are wrapped up in their major, and they got some very difficult junior and senior level classes within their major, and they work their whole week around that class and have to study for the test that those one or two classes might produce. And then there's the other class that they never took when they were freshmen that they're finally getting around to taking. And they, they can say, oh, you know, that's a lightweight class. I, I can blow that class off to go study for this one. They're, and, and the reason we would use the concept of blowing it off is we've assigned a lightweightness to it. We can move it with just our breath. But the idea of that which is heavy or glorious cannot be moved easily. I have to deal with it. A little silly way to remember that, but just in everyday life, Paul picks that up here in his constant um, uh, call for bringing God glory. Now, to the praise of His glory. And so in my head, I just retranslate that word glory, importance. To the praise of God's importance. And so the idea of importance all of, all of a sudden reminds me that I've got to arrange my life around that central, big, large, important presence, which He freely bestowed on us. For we were the first to hope in Christ that he, we would be, or that in Christ would be to the praise of God's importance, His glory, with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of His glory. Romans 3.23, we've all sinned, there's a word we've already studied, and fall short of the glory of God, retranslated now, the importance of God. Remember, God is righteous, He loves righteousness, all His standards, all His ways, all His importance is what we've really fallen short of. Now it kind of makes sense. I am guilty of that, and that needs to be remedied. And how, how can that be remedied? Through faith that results in righteousness. So the idea of glory is really a beautiful, just a Tuesday afternoon word. If we can identify, is it a literal usage? And the Bible uses it that way. Or is it a figurative usage where the idea of importance or importance seen or to make important, sort of consider God or something as important is really uh, the hot, the heavy idea. So the idea of is it heavy physically or important really is the, the unlock uh, to this word as we look at the word uh, glory. Elsewhere we can see many places where it shows up, uh, whether it be in Genesis or Ezekiel, Isaiah, uh, Exodus, throughout the Psalms this term appears, for it is a term of great application to glorify the Lord, but to now we've been armed a bit with a fuller understanding of make him more important to me and others than he was when I first started to contemplate him. The beautiful idea of glory can really make a difference every day in our life with God.